All right, so uh, we argue about how we, uh, what the title of this is. Uh, I wanted to talk about all of these different semantic media wikis. We have, I think, a similar problem with uh, the NNL, that uh, there are lots of different reasons to have a wiki, um, and the, uh, so we use all of them. Um, so we so we have all these. Uh, so we didn't know whether we should be talking about how we manage all of these wikis or whether we how do we manage the problem of having you know the single problem of having all of these wikis. So Desi is going to talk about the different wikis that we have and what we do with them, why we have so many, and then I'm going to talk about the solution that we came up with for keeping this rolling and uh, managing them. I didn't touch the keyboard to see if it works or not. Oh, I can be the slide monkey for you. Oh. Pass the key, will you? Or not. Hello. My name is Desiree Gennaro. Um, I am the wiki developer, administrator, go-to person for um, Department of Defense, uh, Cape JDS. So um, I'm going to tell you about uh, the active sites that we have running now. Okay, these are our SMWs. We have, these are the current projects we have, and then we have 11 archive projects that we no longer currently work on. So the, the video is recording there if you want to be on the video. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, you moved it. Okay. She was on it. Oh, I, I, it. yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so nice. we have two defense analysis communities. We have one on the internet, and we have one on the other internet. And then <laughs> <laughs> How do you get some of those scrolls? <laughs> and uh, we have uh, joint irregular warfare analytical baseline study. We have a site called Data Cards. We have a site called the Strategic Support for Strategic Analysis, and our own internal JDS site. And we have a lot of archive sites. Sorry, lots of acronyms. JDS. Joint Data Support. Yeah, we'll go through all of these. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about each site that we manage. Um, the first one is the Defense Analysis Community. It's our largest site. It's kind of our catch-all. We have about four portals that are really active. Um, it was established in April of 2008, but it really got up and running in April of 2009. Uh, we have 911 registered users. Uh, I think about 175 of them have registered so far in 2011. So it's really coming coming along as we have more content in and more content being developed. It's uh, more people are developing interest. Um, we have, as of last week, we have 8,414 actual content pages, excluding templates, forms, redirects, user pages, things like that. Um, we have several different ways that we control access to our sites. This one in particular is by the DOD PKI certificate. Um, so. It's not really open to everybody, but pretty much anybody in the Department of Defense. Um, our main content areas are Homeland Defense research materials, so anything about like organizations, uh, areas of, exper of uh, excellence, things like that, that are relevant to the study of Homeland Defense. Um, we have our Irregular Warfare por Portal, which is our most active area. It's a lot of interest in Irregular Warfare right now, so um, we have things like calendars for different um, interest meetings. We have a running blog with a couple, uh, probably about three or four participants that are actively writing in this blog. Um, we have a, a little kind of mini interior uh, recommended reading uh, site. And we also have TIDAP, which is, um, what's the acronym for TIDAP? But it's a, it's basically a data database of different databases, like different data sets, so that are re related to irregular warfare. And then we also have the CENTCOM Irregular Warfare Database also. It's just like different clusters of information about different data sets related to irregular warfare. And then we have our Modeling and Simulation Tool Registry, which is another kind of information space about different tools related to modeling and simulation, and we have our ballistic missile defense comment matrix, which is a large matrix about anything that was said in a high level, from a high level person in the Department of Defense related to ballistic missile defense. So, next. Um, our 
next one is uh, the other defense analysis community. It was also established in April of 2008. It's got 65 registered users and 757 content pages. It's basically just a smaller section of our larger, um, more open defense, or well, more actively used defense analysis community site. Um, anyone can read it, but only people that can participate that have logged in with our, um, an, our analysis community forum account, which is managed by PHPBB. It's what we use currently as our single sign-on system. Um, it's the same main content areas, just kind of shrink down. We have our regular warfare section, which has the recommended reading in the sent counter regular warfare database, and our modeling and simulation tool registry. But we also have a big section, which is really up and coming, has a lot of interest, which is our CAPE, which is now actually DOD data source collection. Um, it's basically a big repository of anything that has to do with any sort of data or baseline, analytics is your, we're trying to suck in all this data to use, to analyze it. Okay, so currently we also have the Joint Irregular Warfare Analytical Baseline site. It was established in October of 2010. We have 104 registered users, 281 content pages. This one is also behind the DOD PKI certificate, so it's kind of limited access. We have six, six study component portals, which used to identify different tasks and track study component output. Um, some of the features we have is calendar, blogs, and study resource list. Okay, so the next one we have is data cards. It was established in December of 2010. This is also a really large, um, uh, popular site. Um, we have 171 registered users, 453 content pages, and most of all of those are, it's basically designed after a baseball card. They wanted like statistics about different data sets related to irregular warfare. You can see there's a very large trend with irregular warfare, a very large amount of interest, and the data that surrounds that. The purpose of this site was to kind of suck in all this data related to irregular warfare that was collected in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, and they didn't want it to kind of Float, like go by the wayside and just disappear. So um, the interest growth timeline, originally, originally the geographic scope of interest was only based around Afghanistan. Um, but recently, in January, they wanted to kind of broaden the scope to include Africa and Mexico. Um, and actually just last, last month, they expanded the scope to worldwide. So we're interested in any any data sets anywhere world relevant to anything happening going on throughout the world. And uh, we actually kind of did something a little bit neat with this site as we kind of made a sem semantic rating system. We used, um, we wanted to capture the rating semantically. So we used a rating system and exported the raw rating and captured that using a semantic property. So um, we can kind of keep track of that and how it changes and get notifications on where it's lying in its rating system. What, what do you mean by rating? Is it to give a command? Um, like a, a article um, or? Like a, how, rate this uh, data set, like how the quality or the quantity or the relevance. Okay. Kind of like a Netflix one to five stars. Sort of yeah. Thing. But to be able to, but then to be able to do a query on the wiki and say, give me all the data sets about Afghanistan that are at least uh, you know, four stars or above. Yeah, or so we can display them based on quali like a quality rating or a relevance rating. Could you use the external tool for people to allow them to give th such ratings? We actually used, um, yeah, we used an extension. It was the W4G rating and we exported the, the average rating out as a, in the raw format and used that and captured it semantically using a property, so. It was pretty, it kind of took one of like, a lot of looking around and seeing all the different rating systems to kind of choose the right one, that had the right input and output, because we wanted to, we didn't want people to go in and you know bump up their rating on their data set 
and we also wanted to keep it, um, we didn't want people to know what other people were rating about their own data sets, so we kind of had to do a little bit of research on that and find the right one that we really wanted to use. Okay, so our uh, next one is the Support for Strategic Analysis site. This one was established in July of 2009. It's gone through a couple iterations. The scope of this project has actually gone from uh, something very small and close-knit to uh, something more broad. And it was interesting to see the um, evolution of this project and to see how we, could, how we had to reconfigure it throughout its process. The main problem that we had is since we do the, um, we've grown to a scope of about 240 registered users, but we have four permission group levels. So this was the first time that we had really interacted uh, and had to use permission groups to control access within the site uh, to keep people from accessing files in different parts of the site. So this was uh, kind of new to us, and we really didn't, because we had no interest in controlling access to different parts of different sites previous to this project. Um, we also use our analysis community forums to control access to this site. So there's kind of two levels of access and we'll get to that. That's kind of an ongoing uh, problem that we have. Um, we have three user community portals. Um, it's just different levels. Uh, features we have is the calendar, an email distribution list, and a comment resolution matrix. Okay, and finally we have our internal joint data support collaboration site. It was established in April of 2008. We have 45 registered users, which is... Can you, uh, can you comment a little bit about how you did the permission group? Did you just use media with these stuff? Oh, yeah. Um, we used a couple different extensions. We used, um, initially, we used Lockdown with NS File Repo um, <coughs> to control access to different namespaces, and we needed to use NS file repo to control access to the files, because people wanted to be able to upload things like, it, it took a little bit of warming up to get people to actually input the actual data into the site, instead of just uploading a Word document, oh, here's my meeting minutes. So now we're actually starting to get them to actually collaboratively develop the meeting minutes, so, but there still has to be like a final signed copy, so. So, and they don't want everybody to be able to see that. So, um, but we're actually kind of shifting from protecting namespaces to make it a little bit easier on the user. We're kind of shifting from lockdown to simple security to just protecting categories to kind of make it easier for the user to lift security. So instead of moving a file or moving a page, all you, they have to do is take out that, like change its category. So make it a little bit simpler. Um, we also use the MediaWiki, you know, user groups to control access, but since, yeah. Um, okay. So we currently have 11 team portals. That's how many teams that we have within JDS. It's constantly changing, so, but right now we have 11. So uh, we used our analysis community forum accounts to control access. Everybody's in a JDS group who works for JDS. So, um, and uh, some of the really good things that we're doing, and we're actually really starting to get a good push, and a lot of people are really starting to use it, get some interest and getting some positive feedback. Um, we have a website portfolio matrix, which is all of, a lot of the projects products and studies and stuff that we put out. Everybody, each person, each product has an owner um, that needs to keep track of that project and deal with requests and things like that. So we kind of use this website portfolio matrix to define and identify who are the project managers of each of our different products. So when people you know, fluctuate in and out, change the scope of what they're working on, you can change the project manager so we know who to contact even internally about a product. Um, we have our seating chart and our phone list, you know, something pretty simple. Um, we also you do our after action reports in there. We used to just type up a Word document, you know, pretty simple, and then distribute it e through email 
throughout the whole office. Now we do it semantically, so it kind of cuts down a little bit on duplication. Um, it enhances collaboration because generally, like Clarence and I are here together, we would have to do an after action report, but we can write it together instead of me writing it and then him just looking at it afterwards. So, um, and you can also see the if different iterations and what they have changed, what they haven't. You know, it's a lot easier to use than the uh, comment stuff. And you have to put an after action. Yes. <laughs> Every day. I thought that was only in the field. <laughs> every, every, every meeting. So. Actually, didn't work. So any like major, any major event. So where there's a, like a result, or you want versus you want something to you know be shared with the public, or our public. We also have our some of our standard operating procedures, you know, and we have up and coming now our virtual scrum wall. Folks, uh, are there yet? Okay, so this is yeah, how we manage all this stuff. Oh, no, that's oh, us. Uh, these are some of the extensions that we use. <laughs> these are some of the extensions that we use in our site. To get the data in, we use semantic forms to kind of make it a little bit easier on the regular everyday user. Um, we also use semantic form inputs. Uh, semantic internal objects, external data and data transfer. Because some of the data we actually suck in from external databases. Uh, to auto build pages. Uh, to search the data, we use the run query function of semantic forms, uh, semantic compound queries, and semantic drill down. Now, to get the data out, we use semantic results formats to display it in things like, you know, graphs, charts, tables, CSV export, RSS feeds, things like that. Next. And some of the positive outcomes that we've experienced. Um, in using semantic enabled wikis is um, it's decentralized the development of you know different databases and projects so uh, there's been minimal investment to the technical infrastructure so it's um, keeping everything kind of decentralized where people don't have to all go to one place to work on one project you know it enables collaboration through um, you know being apart from each other um, Okay, so yeah, and I would kind of went through that. It links the communities together. Um, it develops different solutions within the Department of Defense and different DOD efforts around the world. Um, increases vis visibility and transparency, which is kind of a big push right now within the Department of Defense. It's a very slow push, but it's still there. Um, increases participation, participation and collaboration. And one of the big things is it's starting to eliminate duplication. One big thing that we've noticed within the Department of Defense is there's a lot of duplication of effort. So, okay. I spell on it. Okay, so um, some of our ongoing challenges. We still use Internet Explorer 6 yeah. in a lot of places within the Department of Defense. So that kind of limits our options in a lot of things. Like we can't use Semantic Media Wiki Plus because of IE6. So we are st we are up to IE seven, <laughs> but still not all that great. Um, <laughs> so um, actually, we, in, in, in uh, our stats for uh, in February, uh, we pulled stats off of uh, people hitting our website, and uh, nearly sixty percent of our users were still using IE six. Wow. Do they so know there's a new one? <laughs> I think we number seven. Okay. Or eight, well, eight, or nine. I think they, we have to be the line They're not we have to be in control. control. It's well, yeah, well, well, no, I, but I mean, uh, no, I, understand, I know that. I know they can't just use eight or nine. But, but I mean, so certain users have to use six for some reason or another? Because yeah. they're, okay. because they individual been users have, are relying on their local, their local agency CIOs, and their local agency CIOs haven't necessarily done the work to get them upgraded. Okay. Are you guys still contracted or are you working now with them? This is inside government, inside the government. You guys? Yeah, we're on-site contractors. But you're still contracted, right? That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, another big hurdle that we have is our single sign-on system. Yeah. PHPVB is what we currently use. It's good. It's okay. But it's not going to cut it. Like, we need something better, but we need that 
you know, level of effort. We need, we need a, we need, we need a body. <laughs> we need somebody to actually, you know, to, to do it. We need the interest from our DOD counterparts. Um, protection. Um, Desiree, I don't understand that PHP DB is a discussion board software. Yeah, we use, there's a plugin, PHPB auth, All right. for Semantic Media Wiki, or for Media Wiki, and that's what we use to authenticate oh. between it, because we sometimes, we integrate the forums into some of the sites, and okay. so you use the user groups within PHPBB to. So just the same credentials have to be shared amongst W users and PHP PD users. Basically, it's an extension to MediaWiki that when you when you enter your username and password, it asks the user, it asks PHPBB to authenticate the user, and then it logs you into the wiki with that uh, username. That's all behind a very large firewall, right? Well, <laughs> the so on this side is happening on the Cipernet, which is the secret internet. Uh, mm -hmm. The so yeah, that's a large firewall. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a wall. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not uh, the best option, but so basically, there are two there are two criteria for you know accessing um, information in DoD. One of them is that classification and, and clearance. You have, to have the clearance to reach that that level of classified information, and the other one is need to know, which is there's a reason for you to have that information. The need to know uh, requirement is it's nebulous. I mean, it's, really, it's kind of want to know. And, or you know, have some reason it's not uh, strictly enforced, so that uh, something like whether or not you're in a user group is sufficient to control need to know, which is at, really at the level that we're at. Um, so protection. Although we are using a collaborative software to do collaboration, they still want to put up walls. It's not always the best thing, but we kind of have to go with what they want. So we have used things like lockdown, civil security, NS file repo to control access, but we still strongly advise that it not be used because as we know, when security goes up, usability goes down. Um, and we have to deal with WikiLeaks. So, well, it's, it's like WikiLeaks. No, it was a wiki. It's not WikiLeaks. So. Uh, next, and I think that's it. Yep, that's you. Okay. So we have all these. Uh, sure. We have these general barriers to using wikis, but uh, we're getting some. It's getting easier. Um, the uh, and with every success we have, we'll say successful implementation that we have, that somebody else will want to use a wiki for their next project. So we'll. Uh, this started off with uh, you. Manage, convincing somebody to use a wiki to implement some project, and then as that project would die down, somebody else would start a new project, and uh, we convince somebody else to try using a wiki for their project. So a lot of our wikis, uh, these two, uh, uh, our defense analysis community on the uh, classified network and, and the secret network, uh, are static, or they stay up all the time. Uh, internal office wiki stays up all the time, but almost all of these other projects are intended, these wikis are intended to have a, an expiration date. So the idea is to set up the wiki, build it up, and then at some point stand it back down, archive the information, and, uh, and turn that site off. And uh, so there's a, we needed a way of dealing with that workflow. Um, and let me hit the slide. Um, the other issue that we had was that uh, so I, I was the one in our office who said, hey, let's use a wiki for this. And so everything, even though it's, we'll say, uh, I'm not a programmer, I'm not part of our uh, web development team, um, I, just, I, I had a project and I wanted to use a wiki for it. And I've, I've, I've only once been able to use a wiki for one of my projects. The, and, but uh, as soon as I successfully, as soon as I managed that success to get people to use a wiki, people wanted to use wikis for other projects that weren't mine. And so now I spend most of my time helping them with their projects instead of working on mine. But, uh, so we, but because of that, there really, say there was, 
you know, a, a wiki champion in the office, but we had no wiki developer, nobody who was responsible for seeing things progress, uh, making sure that things, let's say from an administrative, uh, you know, technical administrative point of view. So if there was a problem with the wiki, if we wanted to update the software or something like that, I had to go bug our, uh, our web developers for enough time to download the software and install it. And it was never, let's say, things like uh, site maintenance, um, adding extensions, uh, doing, you know, adding, you know, writing new extensions, doing that kind of work, was nobody's responsibility. So it was really what I could convince other people in the office to do. There was nobody from above directing, hey, spend, you know, one week of your time working on that. Uh, nobody could direct resources. Uh, so we had this problem of, uh, but we still had, had a growing customer base. So we had people asking for work, for, for our office to do work for them, but we didn't have a mechanism to to manage that work. Um, so we needed a way to deal with that. Um, we also, within our office, we have uh, several, uh, so we're uh, contractors uh, we for business, and we're working inside a government office. In our office, there are about 60 people. Uh, right now, three of them work for the government. Everybody else works for one of four different companies. So there's some uh, competition uh, as well. Uh, so. Our company had started using the wiki, so it's kind of our project, therefore no other company in the, <clears throat> nobody working for a different company in the office can really, can really push the, the technology because then we, our company would be succeeding and so they'll let the office, uh, they'll, let the, uh, the, they'll let the customer suffer for the sake of competition between the companies. Um, but of course nobody would do that overtly, you'd have to just kind of uh, not to do anything, not oppose it. Uh, people who oppose the project because it's been successful, people who openly oppose it uh, uh, end up end up getting in trouble, but nobody can act, nobody from these other companies can actively support it. Uh, so we have these kind of problems. So we have uh, this workflow workflow problems, you know, how do you get from, how do you, like Aaron was talking about in his presentation, somebody drafts uh, an after action report, somebody else has to approve the action after report, you know, to review it and say, yes, this is all the quality is high enough to uh, to submit this, and somebody else has from the government has to approve it to say this is now a government product. You know, a government product. It's, uh, the government accepts this product. So we have those uh, complicated sorts of uh, workflow problems that we have to deal with. Uh, and then this uh, we should do that in a wiki uh, attitude, where uh, people have ideas to use the wiki, but there was nobody responsible for making that happen. So. Somebody would say, hey, we should do our after action reports in a wiki. But it, unless somebody was responsible for accomplishing that in the wiki, or so, unless somebody was given that task, it wouldn't happen. So we needed a way of tasking people without having anybody be in charge, because then you would have this corporate battle going on. Back to the slide. Um, so we came up with, uh, I've been looking at Scrum as a way of <coughs> just managing, as a project management tool for a while. But what really caught my eye is this idea in Scrum that uh, there there isn't a project manager. Uh, the team is, does the project management. And sure, there's a Scrum master who is facilitating the activities of, of the team, but there's no specific leader. And so it was a great way to have the team require something without um, you know, Desi telling the government, I need you to spend resources, because the government can't make the direction from a contractor. That would just be wrong. Um, but we could go to the government and say, hey, the team needs this. And you know, that's, it's, a, it's a team requirement. And the, since the team is nobody, no co company specifically, and uh, no person specifically, it's easy to, uh, it, it's a valid requirement because nobody's in charge. So we like, the, we like this Scrum because it was a way to manage the work without anybody being responsible for it. Uh, specifically. I mean, the product, who, your, who are your product owners? So our product owners are. Um, Sorry. Well, to the next yes, that's the next question. So, uh, so our product owners ultimately, of course, is the government because somebody in the government is responsible for whether a study happens or uh, data is validated or something like that. Um, but of course, they don't actually do this work. They just, you know, approve the work that a contractor does inside the office. This, you know, ratio of uh, you know, three government people to fifty-seven contractors. Uh, so some other person 
who's probably, so let's say, a, a team leader from uh, one of the teams in the office, is responsible for accomplishing some work. They're the product owner. Say, I need to manage a meeting schedule. I need, a, I, I need a way of managing a meeting schedule. So that person would come to Desi and say, we should do that in a wiki. Can you give me a calendar? And I want my calendar to have three levels of protection, and uh, only certain groups can see certain meetings. And, and so it's not just a small requirement. It ends up being a fairly big requirement by the time everything's said and done. So we, uh, so we developed a way for more and more people to tell Desi, hey, can you do this work for me? But we had no way for Desi to manage her time and to manage her priority. She had no priority staff. Everything was equally hot. So, um, so this was, uh, so we like this scrum management as well because we're able to basically pit the product owners against each other. If you want this, if you want something done, now you have to show up to the scrum kickoff or to the sprint kickoff, and you have to fight for the priority of your project. And we drag the government people in into the uh, into the, the uh, sprint kickoff as well, so that the the uh, the government deputies can basically argue between themselves which one of them uh, gets to direct their person to argue for the higher priority of the project. And so then the development team um, has their priorities sorted out with every sprint. Uh, we use, uh, so go to the next slide. Um, so uh, this is basically what uh, we're talking about here. Um, we have a small team, we have, uh, so we started off with uh, Desi, we have, like I said, we have a web, we have a website. <coughs> it's, it's an awful website. Um, it's, it's getting better, but it's, it's an awful website. Um, the, uh, we had our, our division director, our uh, deputy, uh, go spend a year in Afghanistan uh, working on a project. So he's, he's out um, working with other people for the first time, leaving the office uh, to go you know, basically do uh, uh, some, some work with uh, another, other parts of the or uh, DOD organization. And he's looking from the outside in for the first time. And he's looking at uh, everybody else's website. And when it got to me, after seeing other people's websites, I, I didn't even admit that my organization back home had a website. It was so terrible. Um, and so it, he came back and said, I, I want you to, I want more resources on this wiki thing. And we haven't seen those yet. Uh, but uh, so, it, but at least that there's there's some recognition within the office that that. Uh, we're doing good work, um, but the uh, so we, but we've got this uh, this established. This the government's very slow, they, and they and they typically end up developing to the lowest common denominator. Uh, so we have a web team, um, several people, who you know, programmers have uh, great skills, but their assignment is to maintain our web 1.0 website and not to to work on these other things. So only recently, we, when we started the Scrum process, the, uh, the leader of that web team was able to say, hey, actually, this works pretty well. Now I want all of my web projects to be managed by the same Scrum process. And the, one of the, uh, the benefits of that is suddenly, uh, say, given a common priority stack uh, from the government, the new work that's coming in, the website hardly ever rates high enough to, for, to say, user stories for the website never rate high enough to make it into a sprint. And so we're able to uh, to prioritize the wiki work. Um, the uh, I guess go to the next slide. We basically just uh, took a giant whiteboard, pulled it out of the closet, hung it on the wall, uh, started drawing some lines with the uh, uh, alcohol markers and sticky notes. And so we write user stories on sticky notes and throw them up on the scrub wall. Um, we like this because. The, our government oversight uh, can walk by the scrum wall anytime, and they see the pile of sticky notes that's being added to the uh, to the work that needs to be done, um, and they see this flow of, uh, of sticky notes that's going into our work that's been accomplished, and so they can see that the team is doing is doing work. Um, they're able to see kind of uh, what the assignments are, who, how many hours are assigned to, how many hours of work for which priority projects are being assigned or being worked on by different people. So they like that because now they know who their stars are. Um, so really does it. Um, because <laughs> they can see that here's this work that uh, that needs to be accomplished by the web team in general. And 
all of the work is wiki work, all the work that's being prioritized is work on the wiki, and Desi's doing most of it. And so it's, it's, working out, uh, it's working out fairly well for her. We're also able to identify the priority so that the next people coming on board as we, uh, just the, as the uh, say normal turnover of staff, that new staff coming into the office are being directed towards this, towards our wiki. So, and as that happens, um, money will follow, and that's good. Um, it, well, it'll be a, it'll be as a joke with uh, Joel and Yaron. At some point, it's going to be a problem because, like with this, uh, Desi noted, this metadata uh, data cards project. Um, it started off with uh, a teeny tiny bit of work for. Uh, for NATO, for ISAP, and it ballooned up from there to, hey, let's do this inside of uh, uh, our office for the data that we manage. Hey, let's do it inside, everybody inside of uh, you know, the next level, uh, inside the, uh, the deputate. And now they want to take it DOD-wide. And that graduation, I mean, DOD has got a lot of data, um, a lot of data. And if they really push this to go DOD-wide, we'll go from needing, you know, one one person managing a wiki to, you know, really hundreds. So how many uh, semantic media wiki developers could we produce in a couple months? Um, I don't think there are a hundred out of work semantic media wiki developers out there who are capable of getting a security clearance. And uh, the, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I mean, just <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the pool of viable candidates shrinks very quickly. And the, the rate at which the work can escalate um, can grow very quickly. So uh, I, th I th see that as a, a big future challenge. What about swapping some of your web devs into wiki devs? Um, yeah, we, yeah, we have. We have, so we've done, uh, actually, uh, our other person who was supposed to be here, but uh, uh, her mother got sick uh, yesterday morning, um, so she had to leave just two weeks ago. Uh, was basically uh, turned over from 100% of her time going to our old website to now about 80% of her time working on the week. Um, but that said, she's you know a few years out from retirement, so you know we'll we'll lose that, and she's. Uh, you know, educated person, you know, masters in computer science, but the whole idea of web semantics and what that means is completely new to her. So here she is at the end of her career, looking forward, you know, she's got a calendar, she marks off the days towards retirement, and uh, she she knows it's coming, and at the same time she's learning something completely, she's in a position where she needs to learn something completely different. Um, but she's doing a great job. It's, uh, it's good to have, it's good to have support, and it's good that they can, they can be uh, people who are capable of making that transition. Um, the other thing that's good about this, uh, but along those lines, this uh, the way that we managed to accomplish that is we have this uh, so we have this priority stack of user stories. It shows up on our Scrum wall, and then we have uh, the the people who are available to do the work. And as more and more work becomes wiki work, and less and less work is website work. After a while, our webmaster had no work to do, and so she. So this, this uh, voluntary assignments process in Scrum where you know, everybody sits around at the Scrum kickoff and says, okay, I, I can take that task. You know, here's, an user, here's a high priority user story and here are five tasks associated with it. And they're all going to Desi. And after a while, the, you know, somebody has to say, okay, I can take on some of that work just so that it gets done. And so the voluntary, the process of volunteering for tasks under uh, within each sprint has really pushed us to uh, because we keep, yeah. um, Harder. Has, okay. <laughs> has moved us to, uh, has been moving people towards uh, we can all. Okay, you can go to the, yeah, I guess you can go to the next slide. So this is a, let's say, a model of our scrum wall. Are slide. you, a question, are you, oh, okay, um, is this, Scrum process reflected in your wiki. Do you have a, a Scrum, retrospective? A Scrum wiki. So, so. so um, we're working on a Scrum wiki. One of the Scrum, one of the, uh, the priority about a uh, user story about here in the priority stack is uh, build a virtual wiki-based uh, Scrum wall. Uh, so we're so I've been I've been working on that at night uh, after I come back from this conference. One of the things I'd like to be able to do is take this 
Um, so then this slide or the next slide? Um, yeah, so here we are. Um, so this part of our next steps, we're building the scrum wall, and we're trying to build a scrum wall out of the wiki. Um, and specifically, we're trying to take this, uh, we're trying to be fairly true to existing metadata standards, to use uh, folk to identify our people and how to contact them, to use the, the description of a project uh, vocabulary for what is the project and what are the tasks, and then ex extending those so that, to develop a scrum uh, vocabulary uh, that we can package up and hopefully share on Referata. Um, the, uh, some of the work that we have to do here is uh, identify how these relationships work um, inside of Scrum. I haven't. I've looked around, uh, talked to the, uh, the people on the Scrum Alliance, and I haven't found a, uh, a Scrum ontology out there or Scrum vocabulary. Um, but we, uh, and these are the things that we want out of our Scrum process in the end. We want to be able to say. We want to be able to report on these metrics to say who our who our performers are, and let the government see how the priorities. Um, one of my big things that I want to get out of Scrum in this is, as the government, it's, it's really easy for somebody in the government who, as at we'll say at this uh, this higher level, this product owner level, it's easy for them to request changes and to change priorities midstream. Uh, so our director is famous for. Uh, saying, you know, this is your new hot task, and having the entire office drop everything that they're doing and run off on this new hot task, and when you deliver it to him, he'll say, oh, by hot task, I meant that this is relatively important, not that it's more important than everything else. Um, so, but we want them to see, and we hope to, to track through this, uh, especially through the retrospectives where we account for how many hours are actually being spent on the projects. Um, we want them to see what happens? You know, what 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 is the downstream effect of changing priorities midstream? So if they want to break into the middle of a sprint and say your new prior here's the new user story and it goes here on top, at the top of the board, everything else shifts down and everybody reprioritizes their time to that new uh, to that new story and those tasks. Everything else falls off the bottom and doesn't get accomplished, which means they have to go back into the next sprint cycle. And as if you repeat that process a few times. You start to get a lot of stories. You basically, you have to have a new backlog for you know, your. Uh, you, know, you have a, a pre backlog and a and a, and a uh, recycled backlog in uh, in every sprint. And so we've seen that where we have a lot of user stories that are showing up two and three in two or three different sprints. Our sprints are two weeks long, um, so we have projects that should take that should be accomplishable in a single sprint that are seeing their fourth sprint. At this point. Um, and this uh, last one here is uh, last point here is eye candy. Uh, to have the burn down charts and to have these kinds of uh, uh, graphical displays of the information is we're discovering. And um, get his uh, name wrong. Uh, Secretary of Energy uh, Chu. I can't remember his first name. Stephen. Steve. Uh, Stephen Chu. I think. Um, he that's for, had a great uh, uh, great interview on the uh, radio interview where he's talking about. Uh, Going to Congress and presenting information where he uh, he's trying to talk about uh, alternative energies and things like that. He doesn't uh, his downfall is that he doesn't come from the oil industry. So as a Secretary of Energy, that puts him uh, in a relatively weak position. So he's talking about uh, the power of uh, alternative energies and trying to explain this to Congress. And the question was asked: How do you how do you communicate these uh, advanced ideas from? You know, nuclear physics and uh, things like that to uh, members of Congress that they use pretty pictures because that's the only thing they can understand. And it's it's sad to say, but at some point, if you really want uh, if you really want an idea to succeed, especially in government, it has to come as a pretty picture. Um, so this eye candy is, I'd say, cr it's it's here at the at the bottom of the slide, but really it's critical to success. Um, and yeah, and our last thing here is we want to share this back out. Uh, there's not much that we can do that we can share, so anything we can share, we want to be able to put it back out. At some point, I think it might have been the, the very first, uh, that might have come from the first meeting at, in Boston where everybody sat in here and said, oh yeah, I've got, uh, I've got a set of vocabulary that I can share back out with people. And 
I think on Referata, it was shortly after that that Yoram put up Referata, mm. the community wiki, and there's one package of, uh, of terms up there still. Um, and so hopefully this will be up by, within, uh, by the end of the weekend. I'm sure about that, in case anybody else wants to use Scrum. For their Questions? Yeah, um, internally I try and keep everything in one wiki. Obviously you need multiple given your security concerns, but it, it sounds like you've really gone into lots and lots and lots. Are you, that seems frustrating to me. What's, what's your take on it? Yes. Duplication, <laughs> loss of momentum, all of this. This is what happens. A lot of, there isn't so much loss of momentum because we have very few users who are using multiple wiki simultaneously. Um, and like I said, a lot of these wikis, they, they, they start and then they die. And so we, uh, so we might have a single user who has worked in multiple wikis, but they, we haven't had, there, there's, we're just now getting to the point uh, where we built our community up enough that people want to say, yes, I, I want to start a new wiki, but I want my wiki to have everything in that other wiki. And so we're looking at some of the extensions that uh, uh, just like distributed semantic media wiki, where we have a way of accessing other wikis data. So uh, one example is so. We've got uh, one wiki that has all of our modeling and simulation, uh, basically uh, metadata about models that DOD is using for analysis. Um, the uh, what they're capable, what what they're capable of, what they're useful for, uh, what kind of data they need, things like that. Um, we take all of. The model, individual model developers are responsible for updating information about their models and the new releases of their models in a, at a specific database. We use uh, your own external data extension to suck that into a media wiki. Um, now our next step is going to be to start up other wikis that can look at the other media wiki installation instead of going back to the, uh, the common database because we want to be able to treat that semantically. Like that. I have two questions. Uh, the first is how do you manage the, the versioning of the wiki, you know, the build, the setup, all these little things? Um, we just had, uh, we just had, Desi just won a big fight about that. Um, so we, it used to be that we had this very complicated uh, back end. We had uh, a single instance of MediaWiki and it was being uh, that same we had uh, in our in our environment, uh, DoD really likes Microsoft servers and Microsoft products um, to uh, fault. So even when uh, some other product is better at something, since since Microsoft is it's there and available, that's the solution, whether it's the right solution or not. And not that it's always the wrong solution, but uh, so we had uh, modifications to our old Windows Server 2003 that would allow uh, uh, soft links and things like that. And then we had rewrite rules in our uh, IIS, IIS 6. That, uh, um, so we had modifications to IIS 6 to let us do this rewrite. So we had uh, this crazy system of a single piece of software, a single media wiki software with its extensions that we would upload in that single directory and everything else would read off of that. And the site was incredibly slow. And you couldn't update anything or add new extensions because it would break everything else. Um, and so we finally just, what, a month ago? Six weeks ago? Um, it was in our very first scrum. We said, we have to solve this problem. Oh, this was like, uh, yeah, beginning of January. Okay. And uh, so it was, I think it was like a Thursday afternoon. I'm going to do it. And she put up a banner on all the sites, redirecting, you know, basically redirected all of our sites and said, this is going to be down for a few days. And she just wiped the whole thing and starts over. Uh, we realized we can install uh, MediaWiki and then write the extensions in less time than it takes to manage some fancy backend. So your solution sounds interesting to us, but it takes us, I don't know, maybe five minutes to install MediaWiki. So we just do it over and over and over again. Um, each so site each has its own. Has 
each site has its own has its own instance. Yeah. And some you of don't have yours. Separate you have it saved yeah. in some your your instance of media wiki. You don't save it in your actual. And with you have you just re-download the new media wiki. No, oh, no, no, no. No, we just we keep the same build, but we yeah just deploy it again. Right. Because we're trying. To, we're yeah. we're close to what he's doing. Go ahead. Um. Can you share some observations with us uh, with regard to how your end users work with uh, the semantic features, the annotations, and the inline queries? How do they understand it? Are there common mistakes uh, they're, they're doing? We make it as seamless to the user as possible. They okay. have no idea what they're doing. They don't know what semantic data, property, nothing. Okay. We, we make it, we use the things like uh, run query and semantic forms, um, using semantic forms to populate um, a query, um, things like that to kind of make it seamless to them. They have no idea they're populating any sort of data element. Uh -huh. So this means there is there are very few end users which are doing actual annotations? Well. Um, yeah, like hand by yeah. hand, yes. I'd say maybe. Really? Yeah, there's like two or three. So but this means, so this could lead to, to the conclusion that um, the ontologies you are um, distributing for each of your hundreds of wiki installations out there, that you have to prepare these ontologies, including the forms and the templates, et cetera. Yes. That's that's basically I say that's our bread and butter work. Right. All right. So okay. So how do you um, deal then with um, um, uh, user feedback? For example, um, it's it's not enough for a particular user group um, to have just a category named meeting. For example, they want to have it. I don't know, they want to have an additional category or a specialized or a property is missing. How do you deal with that stream of changes or requests? It, that goes, that's the kind of work that ends up going through our Scrum process. So our Scrum process isn't about develop, it was like building the software. It's not managing the software development. It's about managing requests from users to, you know, I want a new form to do, you know, to collect information about some product. And so, to develop, to figure out what are the forms and properties, you know, or the properties and categories that are required for that. Build the form for them, the forms and templates for them, and tell them, okay, now it's ready for you to go use, then they come back and tell us the problems. Yeah, a lot of what we do is data collection and analysis, so there's not really a whole lot of movement inside other than that, other than getting it in, moving it around, and looking at it, and then getting it back out. So are your and users asking for doing that by themselves, these changes? Uh, some. Um, yeah. Some do? A couple, yeah. Um, but you generally, um, it's pretty seamless. Mm -hmm. um, like on our defense analysis community sites, there's a lot of content. It's very content driven. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of data also, but um, we don't focus as, as developers and we don't focus on the content portion. All of the users and the whole user community in each site is responsible for that on their own. They build their own content, they, um, but we are responsible for making, to them it's, it's, it's a calendar yeah. or a blog roll mm -hmm. or um, a, da a way to collect data and analyze it and display it in a graph format. But to us, it's you know designing an ontology, designing a template, yeah. designing a form, making a way for them to query it. So the way the way that I kind of look at it is, is I'm trying to look at it from their end. They're telling me what they want, but in reality, it's ontology, properties, templates, forms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you haven't developed an ontology for like the original work? Yours is more the ontology for the back end, um, or do you? Okay. Well, the the quilt, which you mentioned, the the Sencomi regular warfare database, and the uh, which sounds exotic, but it really it's just um, 
links to places on the internet that have right. social, we'll say, sociographic information. Um, the, the, yeah, DOD's current fascination with irregular warfare is fascinating in and of itself. Uh, but the uh, <clears throat> but the goal of these projects is to provide a starting point to say what are what, what kind of information is out there for us to start collecting information of how, how do you integrate that in some sort of meta model of uh, data, of irregular warfare data. So you have subject matter experts within your own company? Uh, with, well, within the office. Um, so there are analysts who work on those issues, and so basically we're helping them implement that in the way. So at some point we expect somebody to come to us with a list of terms they say, I'm looking at this data that's the metadata about uh, databases out there that's been documented in the wiki. My next step is I want to be able to query those databases using these terms. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a, it'll be the next evolution. All right, I think uh, uh, we should have a next speaker up, uh, okay. Daniel Hunt. So let's uh, do this after.